Welcome to the second installment of our Wednesday night study. We've been studying Discipleship 101, what it means to become a disciple or a study in becoming. Uh, for tonight's study, I uh, want to look at the uh, encouragement that Paul gives a young man named Timothy. If there is a case study in discipleship, you could look at the lives of Timothy and Titus and Paul's influence in their lives and some of the things that he told them. We'll pick up in the second letter that Paul writes to Timothy. Um, Paul is writing from a second imprisonment. Now, the first time he writes Timothy, he is in a, a rented house, and he can come and go, and he can receive visitors. He's kind of on house arrest. The second letter, Paul's in, the, in a dungeon. He's in an isolated, solitary dungeon, and he believes, and accurately so, that he's going to be executed. And so he's writing Timothy. We'll pick up partway in, into the letter. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me as his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. First thing Paul says is, look, as a disciple as a person that I'm training or mentoring, I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to be ashamed of the gospel. I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be ashamed of me as his prisoner. I'm suffering for the gospel, and you've got to be prepared. You've got to be ready to, to suffer the same. And, and I'm able to endure this suffering by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy life. Now, he didn't save us and call us to a holy life because of anything we've done. This is not something that we deserve. It is not something that we achieve. It is something that is given to us, and then we grow into it. And God gave us this. God saved us. God called us to this, to this holy life because of His purpose. He's got a purpose for doing this with us. He's got a purpose for calling us into this life. And that purpose was well established before the beginning of time. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Paul says, look, you're participating in this because God wants you to. You're participating in this because you've been called to this, and this calling that you received was because of this grace, and this grace was given to you before the beginning of time. When God created people, He understood that we would possess the capacity for imperfection, and God made allotments to call us out of that imperfection, to call us out of death into immortality, He's going to do that by taking away our sins so we can live in His presence. And He was going to do that with Christ Jesus. Now, of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know who I believed and am convinced that He is able to guard what I have entrusted Him for that day. Paul says, look, I don't want you to be ashamed because I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I was entrusted as a herald, a, a proclaimer, as an apostle. The, the Greek word there, apostelion, is, is someone sent with a message. I, I was ordained, if you will, as a herald and as an apostle and as a teacher. And I'm not ashamed of this. Now, it's because of my teaching. It's because of my apostleship. It's because I've been traveling about heralding this message that I am in chains, but I'm not concerned about that. I'm convinced, I'm persuaded that what I have entrusted to God, the thing that I have committed to God for safekeeping, He will keep and He will give to me on that day. Now, is this Paul's soul? Is this the crown of life that he'll mention later? Or is this that if I keep my commission, God will keep His promise? I don't really know. But Paul tells Timothy, I'm okay with being in jail. I'm not ashamed for suffering. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the message of Christ. And I don't want you to be ashamed of that either. Then he talks directly about the process of discipleship. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern 
of sound teaching. Paul says, as a disciple, the first thing you become is a learner. You take the pattern that I received, and I take the pattern that was given to me, and I pass that pattern on to you, and you reproduce it. And now there's, there's a difference in reproducing something because it's tradition, and there's a difference in reproducing something because it's inspired and it's God-designed. Paul says, this particular message that you have is what you heard from me, inferred is, and I heard it from Christ, or I received it from the Holy Spirit, and you keep this pattern of sound teaching. I'm your teacher, and you hold fast, you hold true, you stay with what I have taught you. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. He says, I've taken this thing that was deposited in me. I've taken this teaching. I've taken this pattern, and I've entrusted it to you. Now that you have it, you should guard it. You should guard it, number one, because it, I trusted you to give it to you. I have faith in you, and then you guard it, and it can only be guarded with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Our capacity to become, our capacity to do, our capacity for what it is that God wants us to do is, is aided because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Verse 15, Paul says, You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagelus and Hermogenes. Paul is going to remind Timothy that, hey, sometimes this path that you walk as a disciple, this path that you walk as a Christian could be lonely. And when things get difficult, that kind of when it sorts out the, the, the authentic from the non-authentic. When persecution shows up and when difficulties come, the people who aren't really committed, the people who aren't really faithful, either get distracted or they get disillusioned or they get afraid. Paul says, you know that everybody in the province of Asia. Now, that's not people in a town. That's not people from a congregation. He said, everybody in this province has, has deserted me, but I'm still not ashamed. They're afraid that if they are loyal to me, they'll end up in the same prison. They may be afraid that they'll suffer. I'm not ashamed. I'm suffering, and I want to encourage you not to be ashamed of my suffering and prepare yourself. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Paul says, you got all these people who did desert me, but this one man and his household, may God be merciful to him because he did not desert me. He was not ashamed of my chains, and he often refreshed me. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. The backstory of this gentleman on this verse is a fascinating study. Uh, maybe it'll be something that we can discuss at another time. But Paul says, not only did this guy, he wasn't ashamed of me and he helped me and he refreshed me. But when he came to Rome, he searched for me. Now think about what it would be like to find somebody in the capital city of Rome. Think about it. You don't have the ability to text them. You don't have the ability to tweet. You don't have the ability to connect with them on the internet. You don't have the ability to drop a pen at your location. And I'm going to infer that this man found Paul in prison. So now you've got to walk up to a Roman official. You've got to walk up to somebody who has been told under Nero, hey, these Christian guys are people you watch out for. They're guilty of sedition and rebellion, and we're going to persecute them. And you've got to walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm looking for a guy. He's possibly a prisoner. Oh, a prisoner in our jail. What has he done? Well, he's a Christian. Well, what do you have to do with him? Well, I, I'm a Christian too. A true disciple is not ashamed of their identity. A true disciple is not ashamed of associated with other disciples, and he's not ashamed of being labeled as one. And Paul says, I, I want God to show mercy on this man and his household because not only was he not ashamed of me and he refreshed me, but when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me. And I'm going to infer that that meant he went through the legal procedure of finding this guy who's a prisoner. 
So you then, this is chapter 2, continuing the same thought. So you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Look at Onesiphorus. Look at me. Look at the people who've deserted me. Look at the fact that I'm in jail and I'm not ashamed. Look at the fact that you've been entrusted with the same message that I've been entrusted with. I was entrusted with this and I entrusted it to you. So you, my son, be strong in the grace. Discipleship is about endurance. Discipleship is about not giving up. Discipleship is about continuing. Now, the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, you entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Now he's getting to some of the meat of what it means to be a disciple. See, at first, when you're a disciple, you become a student. And Paul has reminded Timothy, hey, I've got a pattern that I passed on to you. And because I passed this pattern on to you, you're supposed to hold fast to these things. You're not supposed to to veer from these things. You're not supposed to depart from these things. You're supposed to hold to this pattern. It was entrusted to me because I'm a, a herald. I'm an apostle. I'm a messenger. And I'm making you the same thing, not an apostle, but a messenger and a herald. And now that I've taught you these things, and once you've become a taught one, a trained one, a disciple, you take these things and you entrust them to reliable men who are qualified to teach others. The process of becoming a disciple is we first become students, and then we become teachers. And Paul says, now, as as you choose these people, you're entrusting these things into reliable men who will be able to teach others. I I guess there's maybe a level or or layers to Christianity. There's, There's some people that you teach the gospel to because they need salvation. And then there's people that you teach the gospel to, and once their salvation is secured, you recognize that they are, number one, reliable, and they have the potential to become teachers. And Timothy was, was ordered, or Timothy was exhorted, you find these men who are reliable and who are able to teach others, and you entrust these things to them. So discipleship self-propagates. Discipleship doesn't dead end. It doesn't stop. You don't take the secrets to your grave with you. Paul says, I've passed on to you. Now that you've matured, you find reliable men, men who will participate in the process of becoming. They will first be your students, and as they become reliable students, they will also become reliable teachers. You pass these things on to these men. Now, this process is going to involve hardship. Endure then hardship with us like a good soldier. In fact, you'll say like a good soldier of Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. And similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So Paul is commissioned to Timothy, now that I've taught you, you hold fast to this pattern. You, you take these things that I've instructed you in and you don't veer from it. You, you don't go to the right or to the left. You stay on course. You take this pattern and the things that you've heard me say, you've also heard other witnesses verify that this is a reliable, verifiable truth And then once your process of becoming a student matures, then you also become a teacher. And you take the things that I've given you and you entrust them into these men. Now understand that this process of becoming a student and becoming a teacher is probably going to have some dangers. I'm in jail because I'm a teacher. I'm in jail because I'm a herald. I'm in jail because I'm an apostle. So I want you to endure hardship. Part of the process of becoming and becoming a disciple or or as a disciple, a person who is being transformed, is going to involve hardship. Now, sometimes that hardship is external. Sometimes it's because we're going to be persecuted. We may be 
talked bad about. We may be put in Facebook jail. We may be put in real jail. We may be asked to blaspheme or compelled to deny. We may be asked to hold close things that we believe to be true for fear of being politically correct or to offend people. But sometimes hardship comes simply because that's the path we choose to walk. Uh, in the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew writer in, in chapter 12 compares suffering as discipline. Because any time God allows you to suffer, you need to view that as discipline. At the same time, any discipline, the word for disciple, anything that you learn to do has to involve suffering. If you learn to play tennis, if you learn to work out, if you learn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, if you learn to shoot, if you learn to type, if you learn to knit, Anything that you do, any discipline, any training you have involves some type of hard work, some type of hardship, some type of suffering, simply because of the choices that we're making and the things we're choosing to do versus the things we're choosing not to do. So he tells Timothy, as a student who's becoming a teacher of others, to help them be qualified to teach others this discipleship process, making disciples who will make disciples, Paul says, now you endure hardship. And he basically gives three examples of, of what a disciple is to become. The first one is you endure hardship as a good soldier. Nobody who's enlisted gets entangled and worries about civilian things. Because if you get involved in what's going on at home, if you get involved in civilian affairs, you can't please the guy who recruited you. Now... Our military works a little differently than theirs. And in some cases, you get a personal invitation from a leader. You get a personal invitation from a general or a senator to say, hey, I want you to participate with me in this legion. I want you to participate with me on this campaign. Now, there was always the idea that if you participate with me, you get to share in the glory, you get to share in the bounty. But if somebody came to you and personally recruited you and said, I've got a mission I'm going on. I'm going on a mission for the emperor and I've handpicked you to go with me. What does your focus become? You don't worry about what's going on at home. You don't worry about civilian affairs. You don't worry about the stock market. You don't worry about video games. You don't worry about athletics. You leave the civilian life and you become a soldier. And even our part-time soldiers. You know, if you join the reserves or you join the National Guard and you hear that commercial, you know, one weekend a month, two weekends a year, you're a civilian soldier. No, 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 you're a soldier. Because it doesn't matter if you're in law school. It doesn't matter if you're about to get married. It doesn't matter if your wife is pregnant. If you are a soldier in the reserves of the National Guard and war breaks out and they decide to send you somewhere, you don't get to vote. You get to go. And that's it. And you don't, you don't really get to say, well, because of my entanglements in the civilian. No, you're a soldier. Even though it was advertised that you're a weekend soldier, you're a part-time soldier, you really are just a soldier. And Paul is telling Timothy, if you've decided to be a soldier, a soldier for Christ, you don't worry about anything that, that doesn't involve soldiering. You don't get distracted. You don't get entangled. You don't concern yourself with the things of civilian life. I've had the privilege to talk to, to some men who were soldiers, professional soldiers, guys who did tours of duty and guys who were in combat. Uh, had some interesting discussions with a gentleman who was a uh, Tier 1 Delta Force operator, a bomb technician. Uh, tier 1 Delta Force bomb technician and an electrical engineer. I think there's two of those on the planet. And he told me the hardest part about coming back home was he said, over there, you patrol, you eat, you PT, you rest. He said, when you come home, life is so much more complicated. You have kids and mortgages and soccer and work and athletic events that your kids are involved in and, and the washer breaks and the dry breaks. He said, as a soldier, you don't worry about anything but being a soldier. You patrol, you PT, you eat, you sleep, and you repeat. He said being a soldier is very simple because that's all you are when you're a soldier. Paul's telling Timothy, uncomplicate your life. If you're going to be a true disciple, if you're going to be a teacher of teachers, teaching people to mature, you got to endure hardship like a soldier. 
because a soldier leaves home and he lives in the field and he's engaged in warfare and that's hard work and it requires not something that you do but it's something that you are and then he says another example of this is an athlete an athlete will not win the prize Un, un, unless he competes according to the rules. He will not win the victor's crown, a little laurel leaf crown that he put on his head. And He said, you can't participate in these athletic events and not be sold out to your training. Um, their Olympics, the Isthmian Games in Corinth, and maybe even some precursors to the Olympics, uh, involved people who were amateur athletes but really that idea of being an amateur athlete, a person who's going to participate in those games, had to have a strict lifestyle. He had to have a self-discipline. He had to have self-control. And he also had to compete according to the rules. There's a path that you get in and you stay in. And an athlete is really not something that you just do, but at that level of competition, it's something that you become. Uh, I'm personal friends with a handful of professional athletes. Now, I'm somewhat athletically active. I do some things outdoors. I enjoy a couple of uh, obscure sports. I like to, to do some of that. Uh, one of my favorite uh, professional fighters, he's retired now, but one of my favorite professional guys was a guy named Randy Couture. Uh, Randy Couture was a, a mixed martial artist, and Randy Couture and I are the same age. And so back in his uh, late 40s, early 50s, he was kind of my benchmark. Uh, you know, I try to kind of compare myself to Couture. At age 50, uh, he was in a championship fight and went five rounds with a guy named Tim Silva. Tim Silva, I think, is a foot and a half taller and maybe had 50 pounds plus on Couture, and Couture dominated him. He enforced his will on him the entire match. One of the best uh, mixed martial arts uh, bouts you'll ever see. Uh, you got a guy who should be outmanned, outgunned, and Couture was stellar. Now, he should have retired after that fight. He didn't and got embarrassed and a couple more. But that fight was kind of the epitome of what it is to be a professional athlete. And so he was kind of my benchmark. And I would tell Jackie, you know, well, I had surgery. I've had this injury or I've done this. And, and, you know, Randy Couture, and she would say, honey, Randy Couture is paid to be an athlete. She said, you have a job. And you have a family. And in your spare time and in your off time, you carve out time to work out. They pay Randy Couture hundreds of thousand dollars a year to work out. He doesn't go to work and then work out. His job, his lifestyle is working out. Give yourself a break. Quit comparing yourself to, to that guy. Well, the, the professional athletes that I know, they don't go to work and then go train jujitsu. When they train jujitsu, they're working. They're doing what they do because it's lifestyle. And Paul tells Timothy, if you're going to be a true disciple, if you're going to be someone who becomes something, it's like becoming an athlete where you make it your life, not something you do, but something you are. And you cannot win the crown unless you participate according to the rules. And then the last example he gives is of the hardworking farmer. Now, it's a little, to me, it was a little difficult to understand this because he talks about the soldier and he talks about the athlete and then he says, hey, you know, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first one to partake of his crops. And, and after doing a little reading into some of the biblical views of a farmer, you know, this, is, this is, again, this is not the idea of a hobby gardener. This is not somebody with, uh, you know, a couple of tomatoes and some cucumbers out beside their house. This is a guy who's growing crops to feed other people. This is a guy who's, who's a, a husbandman is how it's translated in the other translations. This is a guy who is, not he does a little gardening, he is a farmer and he is a hardworking farmer. And not everybody who farms is hardworking. The successful guys are hardworking. The guys who are not successful are not. Uh, I know some professional farmers. Uh, Windermere Farms up in Kentucky. Uh, my friend Bob McKendoo will put videos at, at planting time. He'll put videos at harvest time. And he told me it basically becomes an obsession. 
You can't think about or do anything but get the crops in the ground and then get the crops out of the ground. He farms 2,500 acres of beans and 2,500 acres of corn. And he says when it comes time to plant that 2,500 acres, that's all you can think about. And when it comes time to harvest that 2,500 acres, I guess it's 5,000 acres if you add the two up. But, but when you start talking about those crops, when it comes time to do this, you think about nothing else. You're involved in nothing else. You, you don't socialize. He says, you know, he's got a beautiful place to hunt. I've hunted on his place. And he told me when I was out there bow hunting with him, uh, he said, you know, I wish I had time to hunt, but during this time of the year, I got to get those crops out of the ground. I get those crops to market. And so the hardworking farmer, after he patiently does his job, after he does his part, then when there's a crop, he gets to partake of the first fruits. I think the idea is, Timothy, if you do this job like you're supposed to, the, pers the first person to benefit from this disciplined lifestyle, the first person to benefit from being a student, and the first person to benefit from becoming a teacher is going to be you. Because as you go through these activities, as you look at the pattern that was delivered to you, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, and you learn to endure, the first person to partake of this crop is going to be you. Because as you participate in these things and it changes your life as you change other people's life, the process of becoming, like being a soldier, like being an athlete, like being a farmer, you're the person who benefits from it because there's an eternal benefit from becoming a, a, a soldier of the cross. There's an eternal benefit for, for becoming a trained person in your discipline as, as an athlete there's a benefit from being a farmer because when that crop comes out of the ground, you're the first person to partake of it. So as we talk about discipleship 101 and becoming, we first become students, and then as we mature as students, we become teachers, and we teach people that are reliable, that can become teachers, and we self-propagate, and we're willing to not be ashamed, and we're willing to endure. God bless you as we continue our study. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, thank you for being flexible as we've uh, navigated some uh, upsurge in the difficulties that are facing our world and our country. Uh, God bless you in your journey on becoming a mature disciple.